So we've named all of these sons from different wives. And then, oh yeah, and by the way, he also had a bunch of kids from concubines that he gave gifts to and sent them away. So Isaac's there's the important one. There's even more that we don't even get named. So there's here. a million billion sons. Million billion. Right. So So okay. the song Father Abraham had many sons. And many sons. And many sons had, had Father, Father Abraham. Abraham. It's it is true. Yeah. And Abraham that's is such a sweet song, but it's kinda like <laughs> he'd be going to town. If you're happy with the same old ways of dating, if you enjoy sucking at communication, and you have no desire to improve your romantic life, then our podcast might not be for you. But if you want some out-of-the-box ideas to deepen your current relationships, broaden your sexual horizons, develop a better understanding of yourself, or learn more about non-monogamy, then you've come to the right place. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. And this is the Multiamory Podcast. On this episode of the Multiamory Podcast, it's impromptu Bible study. So if you've listened to our podcast for a while, you've probably heard the lack of religious upbringing that I have personally had. But fortunately, my two brilliant co-hosts are very well versed in Bible things, all things Bible. And today they're going to school me a little bit on Bible stories that are related to polyamory and polygamy. If you couldn't tell already that we're in a bizarre world, uh, Emily did our opening, I think for the first time in all of multi-amory history, possibly, except for the episode that you and I did together, Emily. Did I do that one or did you? Maybe. I don't remember. I don't know either. Someone tweet at us. Let us know who did the intro in that episode. I forget. Yeah. But here we are in bizarre world. Emily's doing the intro. We're talking about the Bible. Good Lord. Yeah. So so this, this particular episode is going to be a little more sort of lighthearted and fun as we look at some of these stories. But I did want to just say here that actually for the past, gosh, maybe couple years, I've really been wanting to do a more serious episode about specifically Christianity and polyamory. Um, since Christianity is the dominant religion in our culture here in the United States, as well as in most of Europe. Um, so yeah, it's definitely relevant, I think, to a lot of our listeners, because a lot of us have that culture, whether we were raised that way or not, it still permeates our culture. Anyway, we've been wanting to do this for a while, and I've been really looking for a get a good guest for this, someone who is actually a pastor or a theologian or something like that. But It's funny that that's a word. Theologian. 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 It's a great word. It's a great word, yeah. Um, but anyway, I've, I've had a hard time finding someone who's the combination of... Um, you know, ha- knows anything about polyamory and is willing to talk about it publicly on a show and also who's available. And has an opinion that's not just polyamory is wrong. Well, yeah, who like someone who's willing to engage in a more nuanced conversation about it. Um, and I, I have found some people who, some pastors who do speak more openly about it, but in contacting them, they just weren't available. You know, their schedule was too busy with stuff. So anyway, just so you know, that is something I do really want to do because that is a a topic that I think would be relevant to a lot of our listeners. So if you know anyone, let us know. Yeah, if you know anyone, definitely send send them our way. Um, Yeah, it is interesting because as some of our listeners probably know, you know, Jace and I both had uh, evangelical Christian upbringings um, that were were different, obviously, in their own Mm -hmm. individual respects, but still a lot of similar through lines in like the kind of doctrine that we were raised on. Um, Neither of us identify as Christian anymore. um, But I do think it is interesting to have this conversation kind of examining the stories that we were raised with, and what we were taught about multi-partner relationships. And if any of that's translated to our philosophies as adults, I don't know. I guess we'll discover that in the, this episode, maybe. I um, mean, you all know a lot of Christian things that I don't, <laughs> and music, and you're singing it. It's the kind of thing where it's like, even if you don't identify as Christian anymore, it's a lot of brain space that these stories and like parables and songs still take up. It's pretty funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so anyway, spoiler alert for our listeners. Um, generally speaking, Multi-partner relationships that are portrayed in the Bible are problematic. You know, lots of patriarchal polygamy and concubines and harems and slave girl ownership and 
all those things. Um, but again, product of its time. Um, also, I found in doing a little bit of research for this episode that portrayals of polygamy in the Bible interesting because it's often interpreted in sometimes problematic ways like either either it's interpreted as like a literal as in oh polygamy is what god said is the correct way to do and so that's why i need to start collecting child brides and building a harem Mm -hmm. um or it's interpreted as like (laughs) i've seen interpretations of um like every single person in the bible who practiced polygamy had something bad happen to them so clearly god's trying to tell us that marriage is just one man and just one woman um Mm which in itself has has some problems. Um, anyway, so the stories that we're talking about today are primarily from the Old Testament. So that means that not only are they Christian stories, they're also Jewish and also Muslim stories as well. Um, and we aren't here to lambast or make any particular commentary on Christianity as a faith or Judaism as a faith or Islam as a faith. Um, We're just here to kind of tell some Bible stories to someone who has never heard these Bible stories before, essentially. Yeah. And while we may be critical of the stories themselves, that doesn't mean that we're necessarily criticizing the religion as a whole. Um, Yeah. Because as we said, you know, there's a wide variety of interpretations of these stories, you know, regardless of how you practice your religion today uh, these are still the stories that are historically part of that. So whether you interpret that meaning we should do it that way, or you interpret that as, yes, this is the history of the people this religion descended from, but that doesn't mean that that's how we should do it. In fact, we definitely shouldn't, which would be the camp that we would be in here. But anyway, just wanted to preface it with that. I apologize in advance for my face if you are watching the YouTube <laughs> video because it often um, is going to be potentially incredulous looking or just surprised or something. It's uh, yeah, it, difficult for me to not show my emotion. And that's just Thank simply because I, I don't know these stories at all and they might be surprising to me. So that's not me being like, this is wrong or bad. It's just me being like, wait, really? What? <laughs> oh? <laughs> so You're just so, I love that we're advance. starting out an episode with you apologizing for your face ahead of time. Yeah. Yes, well. Everyone, sorry for Emily's face. We've, exactly. <laughs> sorry nothing we can we've do tried, We've it. tried our best. <laughs> I know. We've tried to fix it, but it's unfixable. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, with that, um, also, I did like little to no... Um, anything I'm ba- they're like basically going to tell me these stories and I'm just gonna right Edgar and I prepared them. these kind of in secret from Emily yes I mean, well I watched you Zuruhanya videos so, right. um, <laughs> so this will be Emily's first time hearing these stories I mean everyone interprets their their relationship with God differently yes <laughs> mine just happens to be in the form of figure skaters <laughs> got it okay so let's get into it shall we yes Cool. So um, we are going to be talking mostly about four different uh, men from the Bible. Uh, do we want to give a preview of who those are real quick? So for those of you, you can go run and get your notes from Bible school. and Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're talking about the four greats. Actually, these are probably like the four rock stars of the Old Testament, yeah, I I'd would say think. So. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk about Abraham and his relationship exploits. Mm-hmm. We're going to talk about Jacob and his adventures and we're also going to be talking about king david and king solomon yes uh and uh yeah we've broken this down so i guess i'm doing kind of the daddies and granddaddies and dedicators doing the sons and grandsons so that's not so how my everyone, brain broke it down but everyone we can in the go bible with that. is related well these particular people are related a that lot is, of people that is in the actually bible a big thing related. in the old testament yeah. is that like there's this particular one lineage that right. everyone's, you know, connected to, to a certain extent. And pretty mm-hmm. much all the famous main characters are on the same lineage. It's very Lord of the Rings. To give you an analogy you might understand, it's also very Game of Thrones. Okay. Where it's like, oh, this person is the, Lannister you know, House. the nephew of this person who was married to this First person of his name. who was son of that, per- right? That kind of thing. Okay. The Bible's got the same thing. It's basically Game of Thrones. Okay. Um, and <laughs> it, are they all going after a throne? Or no. Let's I mean, just some, dive into it. Let's just start yeah, let's just start yes. us out. 
All right. So um, the first person that we're going to talk about here is uh, Abraham. So the story of Abraham is told in the book of Genesis, which uh, is the first book of the Bible. Emily, I don't know if you because knew that. Because it's Genesis. Mm-hmm, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, I've actually been listening to a lot of Genesis lately at work. Um, what? You mean like the band? Yeah, like the... Oh, the, I can hear them calling in <laughs> the night. <laughs> close, close, close enough. Um, yeah, Phil been, Collins. been rocking out to some Phil Collins. Yes. Um, anyway, so um, here's, here's the deal. So we're going to try to keep these stories focused not on sort of the whole stories of these dudes, but more on uh, their relationship situation. Uh, it's hard to stay on task here, but we're going to do our best. So, uh, Abraham, um, a- a Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. Wait, are you singing that song again? <laughs> yes, I'm singing that song again. <laughs> Apparently, there's a song that's the Hokey Pokey. It's the Hokey Pokey for it Christians. It is like the Christian Hokey Pokey, yeah. yeah. Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord, right hand, and then you, yeah. you, you know, whatever. It's the hokey pokey. Um, Decker said you not, flail. not, not in the Bible. Not in the Bible. That's not from the Bible. Yes, that's true. That's from Sunday school. Like half of our audience was like, "Oh my God, yes!" and the other half is like, "What is he singing? Like, what the hell?" Yeah, I um, represent that half. Okay. Okay. Cool. So let's just get this started. So um, Abram, who later was called Abraham was married to Sarai, later named Sarah. There's a lot of name changing in the Bible. Just just That's accept it. very confusing. There's lots of changing names to other names that sound very similar to the first names. Like Saul becomes Paul and Abram becomes Abraham. And but it's but like the names get changed at like a particular turning point. It's not like suddenly the scribe changes the spelling of the name. No, it's like, like God like, tells them to change their name. But yes, why? God is like, now you're Abraham instead of Abram. Why? Um, that's a longer discussion for another time, but, uh, a lot of it has to do with, you know, the meanings of names and like what the, you know, what characters make up that name. Um, it, anyway, it's a much more complicated thing. I'm sorry it's for It's not really relevant it. to the story. Not relevant. So I'm just going to use their easier to say names. So Sarah, Abram, Abraham's wife, um, this is from Genesis 16, uh, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar the Horrible. I'm sorry, it's probably, <laughs> it's probably Hagar. Um, Hagar, just Hagar. Yeah. But Hagar, is that, isn't that from something? It's from Hagar. Hagar the Horrible was a comic strip growing oh, right, up the comic in, the, strip. in the Sunday papers, yes. Um, so, uh, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. Uh, and so she said to Abraham, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. So, okay, okay, so we already established, like, some very progressive, you know, I can't have a child, but I'm totally fine Mm -hmm. for you to go and have a child with someone else. It'll be great. Right. This was a very common practice at the time when uh, wives were not able to conceive would be to have some kind of a concubine or a slave or someone like that do the actual childbearing. Didn't Anne Boleyn get her head cut off for someone similar? I don't know. What's Uh, that story? It's not in the Bible, so. Okay. (laughs) I don't know. Maybe you're, you're not. jumping way too far ahead in history. Yeah. You got to yeah, bring okay, it back. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. okay. So, so Abraham agreed to what Sarah said. Uh, so after Abram had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. So he did marry her. For those of you out there, like, yes, you do still need to get married before you have sex. Um, oh, he married Hagar the horrible. Yeah. Okay. Yes. In addition to his wife Sarah. Okay. So now yeah. he got two wives. And now he's got two wives. Now he's got okay. two wives. Yes. So he slept with Hagar and she conceived. Um, but when she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarah said to Abraham, you're responsible. This, this is your fault. No. So she said, you are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my slave in your arms. And now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. And he said, the slave is in your hands. Do with her whatever you think is best. So she treated Hagar real bad and Hagar ran away. And then Hagar ran away and was at a spring in the desert. And an angel of the Lord came to her and said, um, Hagar, slave of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I'm running away. And the angel said, go back to your mistress and submit to her. And I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. And she's like, I don't know if that's really a good. And she's like, sold. There. She that's, was like, sold. You got me. That sounds great. That does not like all the little babies. 
coming. Yeah, right. Okay. So she went back and she bore Abraham a son and he gave him the name Ishmael. Okay. Um, and uh, Abraham, by the way, was 68 years old when Hagar... It says 86 here. I'm sorry. Yes, 86. I'm, I read that backwards. Yes. Man. There's, there's some controversy about that. I've heard some people think that the way that back in this time, the way that they counted years mm. was different. And so that's why yeah. a lot of the ages in the Bible seem really, really old or Especially like the number ends up being a lot higher than maybe it was in reality. Other people say like... Right. I, because of God's blessing or something, people were living longer back then. Like I, I, I haven't looked into any sure, you know yeah. interpretations recently, but that is what I've heard. Okay, cool. So, all right. So we've got here. First, we have the setup right of of her giving her slave to her husband. So he marries and then her, treating her metamor horribly. <laughs> treating her. Oh, yeah, I was gonna badly. say. Yeah. I was like, anyone in the <laughs> anyone who complains to me about like get, not getting along with our metamor, I want to whip out like, well, you know. <laughs> Could be well, a lot worse. You could have been a slave yeah. and had your partner just tell your metamor, uh, do whatever you want with her. Totally. And it could have been real bad. <clears throat> yep. Um, so then, anyway, fast forward now um, a number of years and uh, some angels, like, once again, come and are talking to um, Abraham. Mm -hmm. And they, I just really love this story, so I'm going to read this here. Uh, they say... Um, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. She was 90. What? Way past it. Jeez. So Sarah laughed to herself, and she thought, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid. So she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. <laughs> this is in the Bible. <laughs> what? I, that's verbatim. And they, go, they go back and forth for another six chapters arguing about it. No, but seriously though, that's it. And then cuts to an entirely different story right like the the bible cuts right off after yes, like you did laugh. i did not laugh yes you did laugh. <laughs> yes you did laugh and then she has a baby and then she has a baby a, a couple chapters later at um, 90 at 90 um and that's when she has isaac um which if any of you isaac, isaac's name means laughter right that's oh you know what i don't even know yeah that, i think that might be. i think that's the case like his name is laughter because of the fact that she laughed when right. god tried to tell her that she was going to have a baby right so and Wait, she was did also god name him well, God generally tells people what they should name their babies in the Bible. God's an influencer, generally yeah. speaking. Yeah, kind of like we're an influencer as podcasters. So God like is a social yeah, in, media in like the polyamory influencer. podcasting scene, like the way we're influencers, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. God's very similar. Yeah. He's a social media influencer. Um, okay. Also, so to go back to shitty metamorph situations, so Hagar's son, Ishmael, who's now maybe eight or something like that, he's still a kid. Mm -hmm. Um, they find him, maybe he's a little bit older than that, but they find him making fun of Isaac. And so they exile both him and his mom. Just like you were a jerk kid, get out. Both Every you and your mom are exiled. Just like Professor Marston. It's like total couple privilege Except where they kick out is, the third. It is very much couple privilege. So oh my God, that goes back to the days of the Bible. And God was cool with it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. well... Well, except remember that God had promised to um, to uh, uh, ha Hagar the Hagar. horrible to Hagar that her descendants would you know be too normal numerable to count. Um, so actually, Ishmael is um, a very significant figure in Islam, okay, um, because his lineage is traced to a lot of. Um, current lineages in the Middle East. Mm. Um, so so anyway, yeah, yeah. So I thought I thought it was that like Ishmael is traced to like being the forefather of like the Palestinian line. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I didn't look all the way into the details of like which line it was, but, but anyway, so God did fulfill his promise there. Okay. Uh, so. Good um, job, God. Yeah. Good job, God. Anyway. Okay. So, so far we're like, all right, there's a wife and then she gives her a slave here. Um, so. Oh, sorry. I just did a quick Google. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So in, Islam mm -hmm. Muslims believe that you know Ishmael was the firstborn of Abraham yep. um, 
He's recognized by Muslims as the ancestor of several prominent Arab tribes and being the forefather of Muhammad. Okay, got it. So oh. he's related to Muhammad. Okay, cool. Sweet. Thank you for looking that up. Mm-hmm. Um, so then, um, uh, fast forward another while, and Abraham's getting older here, and he takes another wife whose name is... Even older? He was, like, real old he, already. He died at 200-something. He was an old, old dude. Yeah, but for all we know, with the way they counted years, that could have actually meant he was 50 or something. Yeah, that's true. We, we don't, don't know. We don't really know. Um, but in any case... Or um, he was an elf. So then he takes another wife. This time his wife Sarah has died. She's, okay. She's she she died gone now. Somehow somehow she Abraham's gone. still living, even though he was ten years older than her. Um, but he's still living, and Sarah died, and so he marries a new woman, and she bears him one, two, three, four, five, six sons. Um, and then he marries another wife, jokes on, and she gives him a jokes couple. Jokes on you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you re- were Jokshan. setting up a, like a jokes on. Yeah, so-and-so. right. Jo- Jokshan, Jokshan. I'm sorry. I'm really bad at pronouncing these Hebrew names. I'm really sorry. Uh, and uh, anyway, she gives. Yeah, him wait. Are you really going to read all of this? Some children's. Anyway, lineage? the point is, he goes on and marries a, a few more women, and then <laughs> check this out. And then one line goes: Abraham left everything he owned to Isaac. But while he was, so Isaac, right, his son from Sarah, Mm -hmm. but while he was still living, he gave gifts to the sons of his concubines and sent them away from his son Isaac to the land of the east. So we've named all of these sons from different wives. And then, oh yeah, and by the way, he also had a bunch of kids from concubines that he gave gifts to and sent them away. So Isaac's there's the important one. There's even more that we don't even get named. So there's here. a million billion sons. A million billion, right. So, okay. so the song Father Abraham had many sons and many sons, and many sons had, had Father, Father Abraham. Abraham. It's it is true. Yeah. And Abraham that's is such a sweet song, but it's kind of like <laughs> he'd be going to town. Yeah, as a child, you never really think of the implications of that. Yeah. No. Like, oh, wait a minute. So, yeah, he is is considered sort of the father of all of the, the different tribes of Israel who were born from his descendants, which wow. um Although apparently not not just the tribes of Israel, but also of you know the Arab tribes and um, you know a lot of uh, a lot of different cultures trace their ancestry back to Abraham. It's why it's the reason why Judaism and Islam and Christianity are all are all referred to as Abrahamic religions. Yes, because hmm. they all came from, from him. Abraham. So before we move on to the next story, do we learn any important modern day polyamory lessons from this story? <laughs> If you're a guy, you're allowed to do whatever you want. Oh, jeez, Emily. <laughs> well, I mean, she is hitting on something that's, yes, but like a lot of... That's not unique to this story, though. I know. It's not unique to the story, but I'm saying it. this, in cultures like ours that have come from this sort of Judeo-Christian background, this has been in our sort of history and our culture for a very long time, you know? Um, that's true it is kind of definitely just another example of like the normalization of Mm -hmm. this myth that we buy into that like men want to have multiple partners and women don't right right totally and like valuing virginity in women uh which will come up in the second half of this episode um oh don't worry don't worry we'll talk about some virgins okay (laughs) <laughs> I'm not worried. <laughs> so, uh, any, anything else? Did you did you learn any lessons, studs? Um. Well, I feel like it was kind of a. If I'm really grasping at straws here, it's kind of mm-hmm. like if you're not getting along with your metamor. Sometimes it is okay to just stick it out, and it'll pay off in the end. Actually, I feel like really <laughs> no. it was just kind of encouraging you, like. <laughs> If you're met, like if you're being abused by your metamor, just deal with it, which is not really not a good great. lesson. <clears throat> not yeah. great. No. Um yeah, it is a somewhat troubling story actually when you really when you look at it not from the point of view of Abraham, which is the point of view the story's told from, but the point of view of all the other characters, it's like this kind of sucks. Like this is right. not a great story for most of the other people involved. Yeah, and that guy like seemed super self-serving. He just was like, I need some kids. I need some more kids. Well, gonna... that's, I don't think that was just Abraham's fault. That was kind of the MO of like, Everyone. spread your seed as far as you freaking can and have lots of descendants. Yeah. And well, well, and, and, well, the Lord also did command him to, you know, spread go and... that damn seed. 
Yes, and that, and that told him that he would be the father of all these tribes and, mm-hmm. you know, for generations and generations. And he was like, my wife can't even have kids. And the Lord was like, shut your face. I'll show you. Yeah. <laughs> shut your face. <laughs> all right, let's move on before we Okay, yeah, let's keep moving on. Okay. Um, He's a so, Emily, the next God. person we're talking about is Jacob, who is the grandson of Abraham. Jacob. He's the child. Jacob and sons depended on farming to earn their keep. I'm going to sing songs about all of the uh, people we talk about here, if I can. All people. What was That's that from? That's from Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Not a song that we sang in Bible study, but I did do it in Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat when I played the Pharaoh. You cool. would play a Pharaoh. I was great as the Pharaoh. Why would he even... play the Pharaoh? I've never seen the show. Oh, really? I know that it was an Andrew Lloyd Webber show. Yeah. The Pharaoh is basically Elvis. Like, oh. he's like done in the style of Elvis. He's, did you shake you your know. hips I about? See. I did. I actually, some parents complained. <gasps> no joke. In high school, <laughs> I did this like summer, not summer, uh, I did this youth theater thing. And um, yes, uh, some parents apparently didn't get the whole Elvis thing and complained about me being like too sexual with waving my hips around. Because you gyrated your pelvis? (laughs) Oh my god. You and your pelvis. Yeah. Who wouldn't get I could have been a fly on that wall. Good (laughs) heavens. Wow. Okay. Well, let's move past that imagery and again, talk about Jacob. Um, So Jacob is also another important player in the Old Testament. So he's the grandson of Abraham, you know, the son of Isaac. Um, Jacob, his his story is really long. We're not going to get into all of it, but Mm -hmm. he is given by God. God gives him the name Israel, which is why we get, why the country of Israel is named Israel. Because the Lord came to Jacob and told him that's your name now. Um, Wait, he was like, your name ain't Jacob anymore. It's Israel. Yep. So everyone was like, yo, Israel. Yes. Trust me. This happens a a lot in the Bible. Just comes up a lot. This is incredibly Um, confusing. Okay. Keep going. (laughs) Um, But we're still going to call him Jacob. Um, He goes on to have 12 sons and those 12 sons become the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel, which is another really important part of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Anyway, none of that's really, really important. So where this story begins, when we're talking about Jacob's love life, um, under some dubious circumstances, Jacob is kind of, he's on the lamb. He's on the run. He's in the desert. um, Wait, is this before or after the 12 sons? This is before. This is before. Okay. okay, He's a a strapping young single man right now at this point. Okay. Um, Bachelor paradise. Yes. Yes. Yes, exactly. So speaking of Bachelor in paradise. um, (laughs) Okay. So the love story of Jacob and Rachel is one of the really famous love stories in the Bible, especially in the the Old Testament. Um, So basically Jacob comes across like another tribe and he learns by talking to the tribe that actually they're related to him. Like they're like some second cousins or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, he meets Rachel, who's a shepherdess in this tribe. Um, And I'm just going to read from Genesis 29 uh, what their first encounter was. Okay. So, while he was talking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherd. When Jacob saw Rachel and and Laban's sheep, Laban is the chief of the the tribe, he went over and rolled the stone away from the mouth of the well and watered his uncle's sheep. So he goes over, tries to help her, you know. Uh, Then Jacob kissed Rachel and began to weep aloud. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Why? (laughs) Also, um, consent. He had... He had told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and a son of Rebecca, his mother. So she ran and told her father. And of course, the question, I'm like, are you sure that's the reason she's running away from Jacob? (laughs) This weird guy came (laughs) up and kissed me and then started weeping. And And then started weeping. I'm Rebecca's son. Okay. So generally, the way the story is interpreted is that Jacob just falls head over heels with Rachel from the first moment that Mm -hmm. he sees her. And he's just, I think, like, he's so moved by meeting her and kissing her, I guess, that he weeps aloud. So anyway, so he goes, he meets Laban, who's related to him, and Laban is like, yeah, sure, hang out, this is great, you know, your family. Um, So Laban, uh, you know, he has two daughters, his daughter, Leah, uh, the older one, and then his younger daughter, Rachel, who's the one that Jacob's really hot for. Okay. In In the Bible, it specifically says, Leah had weak eyes, but what does a weak eye look like? We don't know. She could have been yeah. blind. She oh, maybe I it's just that she, okay. had, she 
Yeah. She had poor eyesight. Maybe. I okay. don't know. She could have just had an astigmatism. We don't know. It just says she has weak eyes. Or they could have looked ra- weak. Maybe she just didn't have a piercing gaze. I, I they, really like, don't know. Right. Yeah. Um, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Jacob was in Good love with Rachel, and Rachel. he said, and he said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. A little bit of context before this, Laban was like, I know your family, but if you're going to stay and work for me, like I want to be able to pay you. And so he asks, a uh, like, guy. yeah, give me Rachel and I'll work for free for seven years, basically. Okay. So Laban was like, yeah, totes, like totes into it. Um, and then in the Bible, it goes on to say, so Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. That's nice. That's definitely like some serious romantic commentary that we don't normally get in the Old Testament. Are you not going to read the super romantic line he says right after that? (laughs) That's, um, I will. Don't worry. Sorry. Yes. Then the verse that's exactly after that. So Jacob's finished his seven years. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. My time is completed. And I want to make love to her. (laughs) (laughs) The father Um, goes, ew. So then what happens now? So normally this seems like a pretty tr- traditional love story. Well, traditional-ish, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, then Laban pulls a fast one on Jacob. Uh, basically, like, he throws a big wedding feast. They're going to have a big old wedding. And then when it's time for, like, honeymoon in the tent sex time, mm-hmm. Laban dresses up his older daughter, Leah, sends her in to Jacob. With the week. Jacob eyes. apparently... With the weak eyes. So Jacob apparently is so drunk he can't even tell it's Leah. What? Leah, God knows if she can, can see where she is. Um, and uh, so Jacob weak. ends up having sex with Leah <gasps> instead. What? And then in the morning sees who it is and is like really pissed off. And we've and all been there, right? Over and- <laughs> we've all been there. We've all been there. Um, and so Jacob comes storming out and, of course, is like, what the hell, man? What was this about? And Laban's just like, hey, what? You know, like our tradition is that I marry off the older daughter first. If you work for me for another seven years, then I'll give you Rachel. That's so Laban like up. totally extorts Jacob. But Jacob is so in love with Rachel that he's like, OK, I will work for you for free for another seven years to get Rachel. Um, so finally, he puts in his other seven years of work, finally gets to marry Rachel. And there's a verse in the Bible that says, Jacob made love to Rachel also, and his love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leah. Ooh, um, geez. Comparison. It's, yeah, comparing. We do talk about the comparison thing. Okay, so, so his they just, love was They just greater. throw that verse in there at the end of like, oh, and by the way, he definitely loved Rachel more than Leah, who he's been married to for seven years at this point. Wait, so um, he did, he had to marry her? It happened already. Yeah, he had to, he had to. He'd had sex with her, like, so, is done. So? Well, she would probably have to be stoned to death if he wasn't married she'd have to, to be her. Stoned, like, she, w- no, really? other, he, he couldn't marry her off to any other man. Yeah. You know? She wasn't a virgin anymore. She wasn't a virgin anymore. She probably, you know, was going to get pregnant with his child. Yeah. He couldn't just like give Leah to someone else. So the thing is that this story of Jacob and Rachel, it's usually used as a lesson. A lesson um, of what? Well. Uh, in- encouraging abstinence before marriage. That's stupid. It's sort of the true well, love waits thing. Like The true love waits thing. It's, waited it's, 14 you know, it's the, years. Yeah, it's the idea of like if you really love this person, then you're gonna wait for her, and God is gonna. But he was bring her drunk and right he had time. sex. I know with they her. leave out that part when they're telling you in Sunday school for the most. <laughs> like even part. though you do get to have sex for half of that time with your other <laughs> wife that you didn't want. Right. <laughs> oh my god. Um, god. Yeah. Yes. So um, the thing is, the rest of the story for Leah, at least, is pretty sad. Kind of the same way with Hagar. Mm-hmm. I guess there is that parallel. If Hagar is the first yeah. one to have babies, but ends up being the one who has the roughest time of it. Mm -hmm. Um, So basically what follows once Jacob has his two wives is just a cornucopia of childbearing. So Rachel can't have any children. She's barren, but Leah is good at child producing, but Jacob still doesn't like her, but he still sleeps with her enough to get her pregnant a bunch of times. Um, And so Rachel, again, this is going to be some deja vu. Rachel gives her servant to Jacob to also marry and have more kids. And then Leah gives her servant to Jacob to also marry and have more kids. Um, 
So there's like, like, uh, this is so terrible because it's a combination of not only like metamor rivalry, but also sibling rivalry on top of it. If you think about it, because the fact that it's two sisters, um, well, and it's just so sad. Like it's all about this fucking guy. It is really sad because uh, the Bible keeps coming back to the fact that Leia is really sad because her husband doesn't really love her. I bet. Mm -hmm. And she's aware of it. Yeah. Um, And she's probably like, ugh, I don't really like him either, but. I'm married to the guy. No choice, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, Rachel does miraculously become pregnant eventually after all of this like servant swapping goes around. Again, older in life, kind of like older um, life, like her 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 grandmother in law in law. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Uh, Rachel does get pregnant, and she gives birth to Joseph who is the Joseph of Technicolor Dreamcoat fame, and then he gets a Technicolor Dreamcoat. Okay, and then Jace. High school Jace yes. is in a play and gets in trouble for gyrating his hips. Yep, totally. <laughs> and then we've come so full circle. So without the Bible, really, I mean, where would we be today? Well, so something I think I don't know where you two would be, but I would be exactly <laughs> in the same place. Continue. Something that is somewhat, uh, you know, relevant to things we talk about on this show, like we talked about with the comparison thing of like, you know, but his love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leia. That here too, even with his kids when joseph is born it's like he finally has a son from his favorite wife and so that's why he gives him this resplendent coat, coat that yeah, all the other brothers totally favors joseph and all the bro- yes, other oh, she, brothers yeah. are jealous of that i bet is, they are which is what the whole story of joseph and the amazing technicolor dream coat is wait and then what happens in it that's that's a no- that's whole a other whole story other for story. another time. Okay. I'd love to tell it to you, um, but I would recommend just seeing if you could watch Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat because that would be a more entertaining way to hear the story. True. I don't yeah. know. It's, a, anyway, it's, okay. it's some good. It's some good music. It's Andrew Lloyd Webber. You know, it's I be love catchy. Andrew Lloyd Webber. It's good stuff. Yeah. Did we learn any applicable polyamory or non-monogamy lessons from the story of Jacob and Rachel and Leah? Don't let your parents use you in a ploy to get some guy to work for you for 14 fucking years. <laughs> Maybe don't get too drunk on your wedding night. Uh, you know what? Okay. I like it. I will take that lesson. We did just talk <laughs> last week about not getting too drunk at polyamory meetups. Right. So yeah, let's have that be the lesson here. Or what, on your wedding night. What a story. To, for the lesson to be, don't drink too much. Because <laughs> you never know what your father-in-law is going to try to pull. Yeah, exactly. Right? Wow. Well, Jeez. God came up is, with some intense stories. I got to say, revisiting some of these stories as an adult, it is so funny because it's like when you hear this this story as a kid, mm-hmm. everyone focuses on the like, oh, Jacob and Rachel love each other so much. Yep. And so they, and like he waited. And so God blessed them. And then they had Joseph and Joseph went on to do these great things. And everyone just kind of glosses over the really sad parts of it. Like Leia mm-hmm. being just given away in sexual slavery by her father, regardless of the fact that that was common back then, but still just being given to a man who's just eventually going to yeah, like, never really love her. That they, he doesn't like as much. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I will also say just I, my, I have a very clear memory of the way that this story was told to me was that as a kid was that, you know, after the seven years of work, they do the marriage and in the wedding ceremony, she's got like the veil and he pulls up the veil and sees, oh, shit, this is Leia, not Rachel. They entirely leave out the whole drunken sex thing. Huh. Like that was not part oh, of the really? story. That was not part of the story that I learned as a kid in Sunday really? school. Really? Like they didn't even tell you that? No, they just skip over. You didn't find out. To- wow. Because yep. no, because cause, I, cause cause for some reason would- I always had that as part of the story that no because because in the Bible I don't know if I read the translation that says like he made love to her but it was always like you know he lay he quote unquote lay with her that's a common well, Bible yeah. euphemism for having sex like he lay with her and then in the morning. Saw. And I also remember watching a film when I was very young that was like a mm. film adaptation of the story of Jacob. And that was the scene was that like, you know, crazy wedding feast. We all run into the tent, cut to black, cut to the next morning when Jacob wakes up in his like hungover oh. stupor and rolls over and there's Leia like smiling at him. And he's like, what the fuck? Whoa. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I guess if they're using it as a sort of don't get drunk and have sex yeah. Well, lesson. to be fair, I watched that film at my 
secular grandparent's house, not in church. So Okay, so yeah, that because that was not part of the story for me at all. Like with all of this, the sex part was just basically deleted from these stories. Interesting. It had a black, you know, it said redacted. It was black. <laughs> Wait, really? <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd believe anything that you say about any of this shit. I know, that's the I know, thing. I'm sorry, I, I mean, look, people who've been listening to the show for a long time know that we did do that Christmas episode where we did Two Truths and a Lie Bible edition to see what what we can make up about the Bible that would fool Emily. Mm-hmm. And the answer was quite a lot. Quite a well, lot, And yeah. I, I will say, we should do that again sometime. Maybe we'll do that as some bonus content on this episode for the Patros. Uh, for our Patreon supporters, get that bonus content. But I definitely think we made that too hard last time. I think we could yeah, have made it. Yeah, we definitely did. Because we caught up on like technicalities. I think we could make an easier version of Two Truths and a Lie Bible Edition. Uh, maybe we'll maybe we'll do that as bonus content for and this. And still stump the true. hell out of me. Yeah. Tell me the next one, someone. Tell me. Uh, yeah, all right. So now we're moving on to the stories of King David and King Solomon. And um, these people David's are a big one. grand people, grandson people. Um, yes, I, King David was the father of King Solomon. Yes. Oh, yes, they are related. So and I went to I went to King David's tomb when I was in Jerusalem. Oh, Wait, right. he was a real person. He was. Yeah, he was, all these are all these are real people. Real people yeah. They are. I thought that they were fictional people. No, they're real. Well, people. that's a bigger discussion for another time, <laughs> but. But Sorry. no, I no, I mean, that, that's the like... thing about the Old Testament is like, it's a combination of not just a faith document, but also an actual historical document that does track like the genealogy. Um, I mean, of. Okay. And like I yeah. was saying at the. the like Noah, like, what is that? That's not real. Well, yes. Okay. So. It, it gosh i'm sorry this is a this, bigger yeah this is now a big, okay. a big conversation sorry, all sorry. of a sudden about like with the biblical interpretation right. what's the line between what was real what was not what was interpretation what was based on fact what is cool though is that there is a whole field of study which is specifically biblical history mm-hmm. um where people do exactly that they try to find other sources to verify whether or not uh, certain people existed at all, whether or not they said or did certain things, whether they related to certain people. Um, you know, there are places where like in the Bible, actually um, King David, for example, mm-hmm. uh, who we're about to talk about in two different books in the Bible is attributed as being a different number son out of a different number of siblings. Whoa. There are small differences because it is it was an oral tradition. It was an oral history that eventually got written down. Yeah, from like so, a hell of a long time ago. Right, mm-hmm. from a long time ago. Sorry, excuse um, me, using the word hell. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, yes, that is a whole much bigger field of study, which is fascinating, honestly. I think it's super fascinating. But it's not what we're talking about right now. Right now we're talking about David. Uh, David. King David, I... To, I'm blanking on a song about King David. I'm sure there are plenty. I was trying to think of that too. I do want to finish my story about going to his tomb though. Oh yeah, please tell us. It, it was actually one of my favorite moments when I was in Jerusalem. So when I went there, I was like by myself, I was exploring the old city and it was definitely bringing up a lot of weird feelings about like visiting all these places that I'd heard about in my childhood and Christianity and like it actually being there and like, oh God, I don't know, kind of this weird existential religious crisis about... Wow. What I still believed, what I'd no longer believe, you know, stuff like that. Anyway, it started downpouring rain. And so like really, really intensely and really suddenly. And so I just like ran into this building, this like really old ancient building and kind of like ducked to the side to get some cover. And I realized once I was in there, I was like, oh, this is the tomb of King David. Um, <laughs> cool. And there were a whole bunch of Hasidic Jews at the tomb, a bunch of Hasidic Jewish men having the wildest party I've ever seen (laughs) in my life like playing music and like singing songs and like dancing um just like at King David's tomb while it's like raining out in Jerusalem and it was actually a really cool moment that I just kind of stumbled on I was like wow and I mean I don't normally think of Hasidic Jews as um like very joyful people but it was because you know the impression I get is always very stern but it was really cool to kind of see that side of that culture yeah Um, yeah it was really cool Cool. Well, let's learn about King David, whose tomb Dedeker has been to. Uh, cool. So, so King David here, um, he uh, had eight wives during his life. Of course he did. 
But he was a king, though, to be fair. That was kind of the thing that kings did, is you just collected... You collected them like Pokemon, really. God, gotta catch them all. Gotta catch them all. Okay. Um, no, but really, though, it's not. It's not even a matter of just like building a harem. It's a matter of all the different political alliances you could. Well, exactly, and actually, David is a good example of that because a lot of his marriages were because uh, he was interested in people, but also somewhat political. Um, so his very first wife, um, I, I actually don't know how to pronounce this name. If it's Michal or Michal or it's Michael. A- M- Michael? M-I-C-H-A-L. Uh, so I apologize. Michal? 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 Uh, we try maybe. to make it more Hebrew. Yeah. So Michal was the second daughter of King Saul. And uh, David was interested in also this woman. Also known as Paul? Sorry, no, different No, that's Saul. a different one. Different Saul Guys, that became don't Paul. don't tell me sorry. that. Sorry. And then Jesus... <laughs> Sorry. I'm sorry. Saul, who became Paul, was in much, much later. New Testament. In the New, New Testament. Testament. Yeah. Okay. Um, this sorry. is Saul as in just Saul. Just Saul. As in better call King Saul. Okay. Okay. Got it. <clears throat> Got it. The prequel. Uh, so. <laughs> the prequel to the prequel to the prequel. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. 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 Um, all right. So, so he was, uh, so David was interested in Saul's second daughter, Michal, Michal, uh, and <laughs> so... He needed to pay a dowry, essentially, Mm -hmm. to kind of, you know, bribe the king to give him his daughter. So this is a, I'm going to read, this is a direct quote out of 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 27. David took his men with him and went out and killed 200 Philistines and brought back their foreskins. The Philistines were a warring tribe. Yes. That that the Jews were at war with during this time. Wait, I... Mm-hmm. Brought what? back their foreskins. Meaning from the penile from the, head? Yes. yes that, that kind of foreskin. Not any other kind of foreskin yep. that you may be thinking of. Yep. I don't Penis know of foreskin. any other foreskins. Yep. I don't either. They counted out the full number to the king so that David <laughs> oh, might be... One foreskin? <laughs> two foreskin? <laughs> that is... <laughs> one... <laughs> Two, well, no, no, no. I was thinking three, more of like a one foreskin. Ah, ah, two, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> it took a long time. Ah. It took a very long time because they laughed after each one to hide their fucking horror at what they were doing. Um, Can you imagine? So wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Did this mean that they were like at a brisk? No, they killed them all and cut off. No, like, much because like they killed them. They killed them. You know, like and instead then, of taking ears or scalps or something, they took foreskin. Kind of like we're going to circumcise them in, you <laughs> in, know, post-mortem. In, yeah. Post-mortem, yeah. Oh, that was okay. Oh. And Emily, this is not the only instance of the Bible of a mass foreskin removal. Yes, but we're not going to get into those <laughs> it's today. Happens at least three or four times. Yes. I'm sorry. The Bible is bonkers, okay? And I don't think that I'm alone in thinking this. Okay, let me tell you, though, I was commenting on this earlier that whenever I revisit the Bible as an adult, and like I read a story like this, like the story of King David or Mm -hmm. whatever, and like I read and I read and I read, and then inevitably I get to the point where they always cut off in Sunday school or in church, where they're like, here's the end of the story, that's it. And if I keep reading, it does become bonkers, like because it yeah. does become like all the weird stuff that they would never bring up in a sermon, like collecting two hundred foreskins. Where I'm exactly. like, wait, what? 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 <laughs> this has been in here this entire time. What? Yep. It's but I can't imagine my like wild. sweet grandmother, who was a Christian scientist, which is also rather bonkers. Uh-huh. If anyone is Christian scientist, sorry, but yeah. Um, and I can't imagine her reading the Bible and just being like, yeah. Yep, foreskins. Foreskins, no prob. But and the then, thing to cool. bear in mind, though, is at least what I understood of Christian culture when I was in it. I don't know how it is now. It was kind of accepted that, like, not a lot of Christians have read every single word of the Bible. Mm-hmm. I mean, that you know, is obvious. probably clear. Cause, well, because it is a big book, to be fair. And then also on top of it, like, usually you're just kind of relying on a leader to kind of take you through the Bible, like mm-hmm. a pastor to yep. kind of point out the most important parts so that you don't necessarily have to just sit at home and read it cover to cover. Some Christians do, uh, you know, so I know in my church, they did have a specific class that you could take that was like over the course of the year, you read the entire Bible. Mm-hmm. Um, so some people do, but it's at least in the culture that I grew up in, it wasn't like mandatory that everybody reads every single word of no, the Bible. Definitely. So that's why there's, the whole thing? 
Uh, I've not read the whole thing. I, I've not read the whole thing. I've read um, almost all of the New Testament and, you know, bits and pieces of the Old Testament. But I did have a Bible as a kid that did have a, a reading program in it that you could go by day by day and read <laughs> day, day by, by day. day. Yeah, I, okay, know good, good, I know good, that good. one. I know that one. I know that one. That you could go day by day and check off each thing you were supposed to read. And it was the description of it was specifically set up. So each day or each other day, I forget which it was, you would read something from the Old Testament and something from the New Testament because <laughs> they didn't quite use these words, but essentially saying because the Old Testament, a lot of it is really boring yeah. and the New Testament is <laughs> but, a little more action-packed. Yeah, because the fact more. that it is uh, a historical and genealogical the foreskin swiping. Well, no, yeah, every now and then there's yeah. a good, exciting moment like this. So let's get back to the story. Okay. So he counted out. We haven't even hit the like polygamy part no. yet. I guess, well, I guess other than the eight right. Wives. This is just his first wife here. So he counts out all the foreskins. I can't even imagine what it smelled like in that room. Good fucking hmm. God. Gives them to yes. the king to say, "Now I want your second daughter, and I'll become your son-in-law." And Saul's like, "Dude, impressed." Uh, so then he he gave his daughter Michal to him. So um, fun story. So, okay, here's a, this is a little aside, actually. So, Michal had no children with David. Of course not, because none of the first wives do. Well, Except okay. Except for Leah, I guess. Yes. Okay, how- that is a theme, huh? Well, Leah was the first wife, technically. Oh, but not the first, but the first one But not the wanted. first love. I yeah. don't know. Okay. I don't know if there was love here, honestly. This could just be a political move. There, Probably. there is there, This story doesn't have a lot of like, oh, and he fell so hard for her, whatever. We'll actually get to that. This seems like a political Later. move because it involves like so. killing Philistines. I think you know? so, yeah. Um, anyway, what's uh, honestly well, no, what's 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 interesting here right is that um, there is sort of a weird what seen sometimes as a discrepancy, where um, at times it is said that she had five sons with Adriel, who's a different dude. Okay. Um, so many, this is from Wikipedia, so many scholars believe this to be an ancient copyist error, that the five sons were actually her older sister, Merab's, but that an ancient copyist accidentally wrote Michal in place of Merab. Okay. Uh, and so in the Hebrew Bible and the King James vibe, in the King James Bible, uh, it does say Michal had five sons by some other guy, mm-hmm. but in most modern translations of the Bible, they've switched it back to Merab, the sister, restoring what's hypothesized to be the original text. However, I do love the idea that maybe this is just sort of a, uh, what's the word? What's the, what's the equivalent of whitewashing, but that's for like patriarchy, pa- patriarchy washing of, of a story where like, maybe she did have another man or another husband who she had kids by and that was okay. We've just like tried to delete that from the story. Uh. And tried to turn it into a patriarchal story. By erasure. Yeah. Well, okay. (laughs) No, No, this isn't by erasure. This is just... No, I know it's not that. I'm just saying, like, equivalent shit. Yeah. Um, So, anyway. uh, Then, blah, blah, blah. He had six more wives. Whatever. Because now he's, like, a big deal because he's related to the king. Mm -hmm. He probably didn't have to collect as many foreskins (laughs) to get those wives. (laughs) Well, that's nice for them. Well, at that point, I think once you're related to the king, you've probably got a stockpile full of foreskins. So, also, again, just like in the story of Abraham, there's, like, a one-line mention that's also, um, after he left Hebron, David took more concubines and wives in Jerusalem, and more sons and daughters were born to him. One line. There's also a bunch of other ones here that don't get named by name. Then, Bathsheba. Have you heard the name Bathsheba before? Yeah, no. No? Okay, got it. So she's a pretty famous uh, Bible character here. I do recall looking over, like, kind of stealthily, and I saw some tits. That's all. That- I did have a picture of Bathsheba's tits up on my screen earlier. Yes. Um, it's. Uh, I believe it'd probably be an interpretation of Bathsheba's tits. Yes, Ooh. this is that's, this that's is not a, in the Bible. There's no description. Oh, it's of at the Louvre. The Bible, I was just there. Yeah, this is a painting by oh. Willem Drost in 1654 at the Louvre Museum. I saw so many tits on that trip. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they were. Tell at us the about Bathsheba. All right, so Bathsheba. Yes. So here's this is from Second Samuel chapter 11. So one evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace, from just the, for kicks. From for kicks. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. That's why she's naked in the picture. Okay. Yep. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, 
daughter of Eliam and wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to her. She came to him, and she and he slept with her. Of course he did. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. That's just she a note. A, she sent just, him a text. <laughs> I am pregnant. I was thinking like a telegram. It's like, I am pregnant, stop. I'm pregnant, full stop. Yeah. <laughs> um, New phone, who dis? So... So anyway, he sees this hot lady, finds out she's married to somebody else. And it's like, don't care. And he's like, don't care, I'm like, the don't king. Don't care, I'm the king, it's good yep. to be the king. It's good to be the king. Uh-huh. Uh, he does her, she gets pregnant, and then um, his her husband comes back from war, because he's in, in <gasps> King David's army. Oh, shit. Comes back from war, and David's like, bro, you're back. And this is me interpreting the Bible, by the way. This okay. is not a quote anymore. Bro, you're back. Like, go home and do your wife, man. Like, you gotta go do her. And he's just like, no. How like could he's I? He's trying to have some some like how liability could I do there. Her? Right. He's like, how could I do that? I just came back from war. I just want to chill here at the palace, bro. No, and David's bro, like, don't you no, get no. Off? Seriously, like, stay here like a day, but then go fuck your wife, please. And he doesn't. <laughs> he doesn't. He just hangs out at the palace. And, and then like, he's like, nah. She getting bigger and bigger. So then. He's like, King David's like, shit, I need a second plan. So he tells his generals, hey, I need you to plan it out in the battle so that this dude ends up on the front lines in a really shitty place in the battlefield and gets killed, Uh, which does happen. He gets killed. And then King David's like, oh, shit, your husband died. And then he marries Bathsheba. Uh, And then um, God's real pissed about it, though. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. God's not happy about it. Nah. And uh, that first son dies. And oh. King David's like, that, that, like that's God's punishment. King David interpreted it. It even says in the Bible that King David interprets that as that being his punishment. Okay. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah, interesting. It, it, it like doesn't even commit to being like that's the truth. It just he interprets it that way. <laughs> uh, but then she has a second son who he names Solomon, and he ends up naming him as the heir to the throne. Okay. Which is also a recurring theme in the Bible of not the firstborn sons being the heir to the throne. It's just like uh, their favorite born sons. Yep, basically. A kind okay. of, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the interesting thing with the story of Bathsheba is the fact that Bathsheba constantly gets slut-shamed. Yeah. From what I've seen, like, uh, you know, Bathsheba's kind of held up as like, well, why was she bathing on the roof when she knew that David could see her? When uh, it's like, clearly David's like the king. wanted to take a bath, bitch. <laughs> yeah, no, and David's the king. He's kind of the one calling the shots here and just like, you know, almost, you know, I don't know. I don't want to get too deep into it. But, you know, power dynamics are there and like, she can't really say no if the exactly. king is like, hey, come sleep with me. Mm-hmm. Right. Hashtag me Stuff too. like that. It- yeah, exactly. Um, also, so I, I sorry. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say one other thing. We mentioned consent earlier on in this, mm-hmm. and that it kind of wasn't acknowledged in the story. Uh, another one interesting that comes up here is that um, one of King David's sons leads an insurrection later on that leads to civil war in his kingdom. Why am I not surprised? Okay. And um, this is also viewed as a punishment from God. Um, so. To, to uh, essentially by getting advice from a relative of Bathsheba, his son Absalom has sexual intercourse out on the roof, essentially in public with 10 of his father's concubines. What? Wait, what? what? I never this read that ga- part of the Bible. Wait, this yes. is another example of exactly. like, they never covered this in Sunday school. Exactly. This is second Samuel chapter 16 verses 20 through 23. For those of you who want to look this up at home. So they, he has like a, like a reverse gangbang on the roof? Well, here's the here's the thing. Again, not a lot of details given, but it's like, is he raping these women on the roof Fuck. so that everyone around can hear? Or is he just having consensual sex with them on the roof? You know, because maybe they're like, cool, this is the new king. I don't, ca-. like, I don't know. It's not even mentioned. Like, it, My money's like, on the, the raping version. I know, sex. I know, I know. It's, it's awful. Um, anyway, super well, fucked up, and this is also viewed as punishment from God for David uh, being a dickhead and killing off a man so he could marry his wife. Well, this has just made me uncomfortable. So are there any positive lessons that we could apply to multi-partner relationships that we learned in this one? Positive? Uh, no. Just okay, that I think it's great like, to be if, king and okay, a man. Just because, you're, you're just because you're a person who has multiple partners doesn't mean that you should try to encourage people to cheat with you. Yeah. Or in, mm-hmm. try to find a way to kill your metamor. 
it. Don't kill your metamor. Don't kill your metamor. That's the lesson. Please. Don't kill your metamor or God will punish you and your son will have sex with your concubines. Also, it's sad. Like, there's so many concubines and, like, so much slut shaming and Mm -hmm. God. The concubine thing is kind of a mix because it's like, yes, this is, like, awful, like, just owning women's bodies and treating them like chattel and as sex slaves. Then on the other hand, I also think about the fact that if you were a woman living back at that time and the king took favor on you and wanted to make you a concubine, um, that was like the, probably the best promotion you could get in your life at that time. That's like your only opportunity for invest for advancement is like, sure you're a sex life, but you live close to the palace and you're going to be fed and taken care of for the rest Mm -hmm. of your life. And so it's, you know, it establishes the same thing of women kind of needing to have these very extreme survival techniques (laughs) In order to get by, no, because it is, the fact that the world's not very kind to them. Yep, it is an upsetting thing. But so basically, what I've been learning from these stories is that we haven't really come that far as a society <laughs> since two thousand years ago. <laughs> well, I like to think that there's less metamor murder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, less statistically, less sure. metamor murder, uh, which is good because I feel like I may have been murdered in the past if that were a thing. Um, I mean, oh, and geez. we don't have actual... Oh, jeez. If you lived in a past time when it was possible <laughs> to murder your men yes. more, you... Yeah, you probably would have been. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, that we don't have concubines now. So, like, cool. Mm-hmm. We've, we've, you know, we've come someplace. It's been a few thousand years, though. We, I mean, we have different kinds of sexual slavery now. But yeah. 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 No, you're right. Nothing's yeah. better. Nothing's better. <laughs> Everything's yeah. doomed. Uh-huh. All right. Okay. Tell us about story? tell us about King Solomon and let's uh, well, bring this home. I liked I think the story of Solomon's a little bit less depressing than David. Let's okay. fucking um, hope so. I do hope so. So Solomon, ki- uh, son of David and Bathsheba, the mm-hmm. second son. Um, Solomon again, another important figure. He built the first temple in Jerusalem. Um, he was known for extreme wisdom. He. Yep. I don't know if this is a true story or not, but there's a story that's often attributed to him of, I don't know, Emma, if you've heard the story of like the two women who both had babies, but one of the babies died and then both women were trying to claim that the remaining baby was theirs. Yeah, and he's and so, like cut it in half. Yes, yeah, that's attributed to King Solomon that he was the one who did that baby cutting Wait, did trial. they actually cut her? No, no. Oh, yeah, like that because, was the whole point of it is oh, that like the woman who was actually who, the the who was mother actually the mother was, was like, the one no, who was no. like, no, don't cut the baby in half. Let the other woman have it. Yeah, you know. And he was like, was aha, like, you be the mother. Elementary, dear Watson, <laughs> you're the mother. <laughs> anyway, so King Solomon, that's his whole jam. Yep. King Solomon's thing was quantity. I would say. <laughs> um, Go on. He was known for having, oh gosh, I thought I copied the numbers, but I think it's something like 300 wives Ugh. and 700 concubines. God. Wow. Um, He's one I, of those guys I don't know like, that's, I've had sex with a thousand women. No, no, both, like, both of those numbers are in the hundreds. And I, I may have been flipping those two, but still, it's both of those numbers are in the hundreds. I don't know if that's at the same time. I don't know if that's just like over the course of his kingly career. This is how many wives and concubines he went through. His kingly resume <laughs> list. <laughs> um, so, like, Solomon was famous for just having tons and tons and tons of ladies. Wow. Um, okay. And specifically, he also, it just, the Bible says he loved many foreign women. Um, so, basically, just any non Hebrew women, mm-hmm. uh, the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, all these other like Sidon- rival... Sidonians, I think is how that's said. Sidonians, okay. I'm all these Sedona, rival Arizona. nations. Um, and this was a problem yes. because the fact that, I mean, it seems to imply that like Solomon, King Solomon basically married every single woman around him <laughs> and then had to go into neighboring countries right. to start... You know, he kind of exhausted the supplies that were at home. So um, did he have like 7,000 p- children? Yes. So, yes, some, yes, basically, yes. yes. Um, oh, yeah, no, you did write it down. A, he had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. That's what it was. Okay, yes. Jeez. So, so 700 wives that were also royal, so all like princesses and queens. Um, right, okay, so all political marriages. Yeah, so yeah. he married so all like, these like political marriages. Truly um, everyone. Yes, truly everyone. 
So this was a problem, though, because God had told the Israelites, like, you can't intermarry with these other nations, um, specifically because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Mm. And I'm going to start quoting from the Bible here. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. Now, that's the interesting part is they mentioned, like, that he loves these yeah. thousand women huh. um, and doesn't want to give them up. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the yeah. one penis policy thing here is not so great. But it's nice that he loved everyone. Apparently, he did love everyone. Apparently, he was, you know, relatively egalitarian. Yeah. Or so the Bible says. What's fun is that one of the uh, wives turned him on to a goddess, at least. Yeah. Okay. So, well, so that's the point is that... It says, as Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God. Um, So he followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. Um, So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. So, I mean, Solomon even went so far as to like building temples to his wives' gods in the city imagine which, that like religious god, freedom in his country and god's like nah thou shalt have like, no nah, gods nah, before dog. me yeah nah, dog yeah so that's the thing is from god's perspective it's like nah 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 you know because god is a jealous god can't have any other gods but solomon is like i'm just trying to respect the cultures that my ladies came from mm-hmm. that was nice yeah. of him. seems like a good guy yeah yeah i know i know but the thing is like god was really not happy with it he ended up he ends up punishing solomon basically a kind of punishing solomon he's like i'm gonna punish you but the punishment's not gonna come down on your head it's gonna come down on your son's head oh, one classic. of your son's head one of your thousands of son's heads. classic yeah. yeah which one uh i think it was like reboam or something like that I think like Reboam like loses a battle like that was the Lord's punishment on him for as his, in he died for his dad being too multicultural basically being too tolerant being too tolerant. Uh, there's another side note with Solomon. Um, M, have you heard of the Queen of Sheba? Yes. What do you know about the Queen of Sheba? Nothing. Just heard the name. She. Yeah, it's it's a weird thing in the Bible because it's this very short passage in the Bible, just that the queen of some place called Sheba hears about how awesome and rich and wise Solomon is and decides like, I got to go meet this guy. Mm -hmm. So she goes and she's so impressed by him that quote unquote, she gave the king 120 talents of gold, large quantities of spices and precious stones. (laughs) Never again were so many spices brought in as those the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. The Bible Apparently needed to comment on that. Um, and that was it? So she filled his house with curry. Um, <laughs> and then uh, Solomon in return says, I'm going to give you all of that you desire whatsoever you ask. Uh, and then the Bible's just like, like, and he did. They don't say what she asked. Um, there's different accounts in different faiths and different interpretations that suggest that they hooked up. Um and for some reason, there's a bunch of art about the Queen of Sheba. There's a, there's actually, there's a Handel, there's a Handel piece called the Queen of Sheba, which I think if you heard, you'd recognize it instantly. You mean um, the composer? Yeah. Yes. Handel? George, composer. George Friedrich. Handel. Yeah. George Friedrich. Yes. yes. She said Handel, and I was like, I know she said Handel. it. Weird. I was like, yeah. who? What? How am I supposed to Handel? Handel. Handel. It, I mean, it's Handel. 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 <laughs> Jace, you're the one who studied Handel? music things. Uh, <laughs> What it, what is it supposed to be? <laughs> what is happening? We were just listening to. I'm some, pretty sure I've heard that before. Some Handel, yeah. That is just, oh, just delightful. See. But it should be George Friedrich Handel. Handel, yeah. Handel. Yeah. I said Handel. I know you're correct. We just don't say that that way in America. Right, we say Handel. 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 Give me a handle of whiskey while I listen to some Handel. <laughs> Anyway, uh, <laughs> what lessons can we take away from the story of Solomon? Um, Solomon is a multicultural guy, but apparently God is jealous and not polyamorous. But also God's like, hey man, that's not cool, but like, uh, let's just do a little punishment. I guess there's a, there's a couple interpretations of this. There's the one interpretation where Solomon is like this super egalitarian loving multicultural Mm -hmm. guy who's like oh yeah baby like you want to worship freaking the goddess ashtoreth like i'll totally 
use my funds to build a temple just for you because mm -hmm. your religious expression is that important to me, even though it's not mine, but I'm not going to condemn you for that. Like, yep. feel free, go to head. So he's like a super woke dude, mm -hmm. at least religiously. Or I feel like more realistically, it's like he got into all these political marriages and another part of political ties is like, and I'll even build a temple honoring your God in my city to show how good of a team player I am. So that's probably more realistically what it was. Yeah, I mean, I like the other interpretation better, but but sure, yeah. I, I think it actually is an interesting example of the ways that we can see, I mean, we see it in modern day politics as well, where you'll have certain people who um, will be viewed by some as like, oh my gosh, this person is really moving things forward in terms of cultural acceptance and like offering asylum to people who need it, you know, helping out in the world and then other people will be like oh look at this fucking cuck who you know can't stand up for anything and is helping the infidels they probably don't use the word infidels but you know what i mean expressing that type of sentiment um right or or someone else who's like a very um again sort of multicultural like pro tolerance and acceptance person into someone else it's like they're destroying family values mm. i think it is interesting mm -hmm. seeing mm -hmm. that i know that's not really relevant to our topic here of of polygamy and polyamory in the bible let's face it it's all just polygamy it's wives. not polyamory well yeah no the only like the only examples of women in the bible with multiple partners are all basically prostitutes yeah although i mean that's maybe a topic for another time but there is even you know, there are arguments like Mary Magdalene, who loves to be talked about as this prostitute who Jesus talked to and whatever. Um, there are other accounts and biblical historians who actually make the argument that she was actually one of Jesus's disciples. Yeah, I've and heard that. And it actually that. wasn't until later that she was kind yeah, of... Yeah, we read the Da Vinci Code. Well, there's... I did read the Da Vinci Code. <laughs> That's great. See, look, you've got some Bible knowledge. Um, but that isn't just a Da Vinci Code thing, right? There are there are some biblical historians who make that argument um, that there may have been other female disciples as well. Mm. Again, you know, it's hard to know because all of this has been decided uh, by men um, at various exactly. points through history. Even the Bible as we know it, there were a lot more books that made up sort of the, the history of Israel. And at one point, um, they, you know, translated these all into German and, uh, you know, we're like putting together the Bible. And it was a, a king at the time, I believe, who just decided like, these are the books that are legit and stay in. And these are the no, books. You're talking, you're talking like way further back before they were translating into German. That was you're before German. About the, okay. The Council of Nicaea. That Got was it. like Constantine, Emperor Constantine, like in the Roman. Thank you. Sorry. Empire. Yes. I'm confusing yeah. my Bible stories or my post. No, but post it's like, it's been stories. translated from like, you know, Hebrew to Aramaic to Greek to Latin to right. Old English and Old German and you well, know the, how it goes. The story like, with the German translation is that they had translators, they had some, you know, a bunch of translators all go off for a year separately and translate the Bible into German. And the story goes that all of them came back a year later or however long it was, and they all had an identical translation of it. Bullshit. Right, bullshit. but that's the, that, bullshit. that is the story, at least that it's why that is often used as one of the source translations of the Bible because there were these several translations that came back the same. Anyway, I guess to bring it all together, I it was really interesting for me to revisit these stories after having lived a long time in multi-partner relationships mm -hmm. and suddenly seeing these weird like stories come out where I was like, oh my God, metamor relations. It all makes sense. <laughs> um, yeah. And it is really interesting definitely to think about the fact that, you know, in Western culture with our Judeo-Christian background, we have a long history of having these multi-partner or polygamous stories baked into our mm. culture um, that are, you know, in some kind of interpretations, like kind of weird, a little bit funny, and in other interpretations, really toxic and awful. So I guess, yeah, do with that what you will. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I learned a lot today, but I learned that, like, I don't know, it's problematic. These stories are really problematic, and it's not incredibly surprising to me that we have the problems that we have today, considering how seeped into our culture these stories are. 
Certainly. Well, there's a, but there's also a lot of things of the fact that like this was one translation that mm-hmm. we're reading from. There's a lot of things when people go back and go back to like original Hebrew when they examine what the original Hebrew word is, they're like, oh my gosh, actually it's this totally different word that totally changes the tone and the meaning of yes. this passage. Like there's so many instances of that in the Bible where things, depending on how you translate it, can sound either really awful and toxic or actually not that bad and really inspiring and wonderful. So it's It is really an tricky. interesting thing. Yeah, translation is, is fascinating. I When I was... Uh, studying abroad in Russia, we did some translation work like as part of a class, and that really drove home for me because at the, at that time I was still Christian. I was actually going to an American Baptist church at the time, um, and it really drove home for me though how much power translators have, like how much how much there are things you cannot translate literally. That translation mm-hmm. isn't a one to one thing. There's a lot of interpretation that goes into it. And, you know, later in my life now studying Japanese, like I see that even more so I think than I did with Russian. Um, but definitely translating from something like ancient Aramaic all the way forward through several other languages in between into modern day English. F- of course. Yeah. Like there are so many decisions that had to be made about interpreting the meaning of things that we now take as like even the idea that someone would think that the Bible is literally the word of God is like, even if you will accept the argument that it was, that would have been an Aramaic. And this has gone through so many translations by different human beings, normal people. And like when you go through like Japanese Google Translate 10 times and then see what you got on the other side. Do do a YouTube search for like, I think it's Japanese translation or like Google Translate song lyrics. There are people who like do back and forth through Google Translate, like to Japanese and back to English and back again over and over again. And then they sing those lyrics to popular songs. And it's just absurd what kinds of stuff you come up with after going back and forth. That's amazing. That's essentially what's happened with the Bible. It's sort of this telephone game through multiple languages. Like, gosh, of course. Yeah. There's so much to be interpreted, which I think is... It, what I think is nice, at least um, about this episode for me, being able to revisit these things is just reminding myself and, and I hope all of us that so much of it is about what are the lessons you're going to take from this that no one, even us, can tell you like, this is the way it should be. But it's like, what does what meaning does this have for you is there relevance to this? Just because someone's done something a certain way doesn't mean that's the only way to do it. I think it actually touches on a lot of themes that we do talk about a lot on this show. Mm-hmm. So, shall we well, bring it up? Maybe home? we should. Maybe someday we could do a more deeper, a deeper religious dive. Uh, Absolutely. I, like a, I a multi-religious examination of non-traditional relationships. But totally. that's for another day, another episode. Yeah. Well, Emily, take us home. Well, I learned a lot today. So, if you'd like to have your question or comment played on the show, you can call 678-M-U-L-T-I-05 and leave us a voicemail, or you can send us an audio message at the Multiamory Facebook page. You can also email us at info at multiamory.com or send us a message on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. To support our show and join our private Facebook community, go to patreon.com slash multiamory. Multiamory is created and produced by Dedeker Winston, Jace Lindgren, and me, Emily Matlack. Our episodes are edited by Mauricio. Our social media wizard is Will McMillan. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Onid from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com. 